going to start with S89, which is Reflective Health Benefits and Yes, so we walked through yesterday. We walked through it yesterday, and we put it on for vote yesterday, and is there further discussion, amendments? This is our be prepared in case the feds do something again. Senator Sorokin has been quite passionate about this issue. Is he around? Okay. I don't I, I, know. And the question on. was whether to extend the Senate said no. the two years no, no, or no, just no, no, remove no, it. No, 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 no. This is, that will be voted out. I'm reporting that tomorrow. <coughs> This is the reflective plans for when they do away with silver loading. Okay, we've got to get the right voting sheet. Reflective plans. Yes. That's it. Oh, gold and silver. And what this does is Gets it says ready. that we're going to stay on silver loading as long as we're allowed to, but if the feds say we can't, which would be for the 2021 budget, but those plans. plans. Those plans are already, you know, will be submitted a year from now. So this would say if that happens, then the cost will get spread over the silver and bronze plans and that there will be reflective plans for those that don't qualify for a subsidy. All right, is there any discussion? Is there a motion? Is it an amendment? No. It's no. just a straight it up. It is a straight up. Move right the first time. They got it right the first time. I, I move we vote S89 favorably. Okay. Senator Pearson has motioned that we vote S89 favorably. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay. That is. Six zero one. Okay. Everybody likes this. Well, the advocates like it. I, I don't have to like. Nice. Yes. If you yeah. have, to, if you have yeah. to do something, I you don't want to. I by saying it is a less objectionable yes, exactly. yes. alternative. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, if we I have to do something well, bad, this is the best bad we can do. All right. And the reporter, they are literally on their way. They are literally on their way. I have had further discussions with Senator Kitchell. They're still a little iffy about whether or not they're, they need to have fees put in this bill. Oh, S89. I got more. A reporter. Oh, a reporter. Yes, who wants to report? It's a rocket. It's a rocket! It's a rocket! I did that once to Welch, and it was a yes. And I voted against it, so I couldn't report it. No one else wanted to report it, so we made him report it. Is he here? Who? He is. He is around. He's not here. No, I, he, he had issues. I'll report this one. Oh, you're, you're good. You are crushing my mellow man. I know. I know. Okay, that one's done. Thank you. So anyway, uh, Stephanie's done some work on pricing out the board. We know there's money in the fee fund <coughs> from medical marijuana. If we start looking at all those yeah, yeah. listings of fees in all those other towns, this bill will not come out of here, not by crossover. So what I told them was, we can decide on the tax rate. We will vote it out. They can look at it, but they will have it to look at. They can price out the board because there's proposals to change the size and the salaries and decide how much money they need, and then if they feel they need a fee put in there, tell us, and I think they'll know that by the first part of next week, and we can then work on doing a floor amendment with the fee, um, with fees 
but the bill will be moving and will make it because this is one that the other body has never done a tax and regulate bill. <clears throat> we have. They've done a just make it legal bill. Oh, so they never. They but never they done have. Done tax they they never have done never. A consumer safety bill. They've never done a consumer safety bill. So we think they're going to need some time to think this through, and we will see what they can do. They have a lot of new members, too. Yes. Who will need to know this. So that right now is the moving it forward plan. Um, Stephanie can tell us some of the pricing she has put on it, but uh, it's whether or not the money people over there, how much surety they need to make the interdepartmental, what is it, payment in anticipation of revenue. Just a procedural question is since you know we're talking about tax here yes. in the bill we got, should that originate the house rather than here? We went through this last yeah, year I, I, and I remember last time this I asked that same question. Mm -hmm. Bloomer told me that in a way the tax is incidental to the program. So it is it is a consumer safety, it is a regulation program that has a tax in it. It is not I mean, in public parlance it's always referred to as tax and regulate. Tax sure. is always put first. Sure. But that yes. has been his ruling yeah. uh, and, and this came yeah. up with opioids or something. It came, came up, up on last this this year. issue because we, yeah. we did it last year. And I think it's revenue bills and it's how you mm -hmm. How you define revenue bills? The budget definitely has to start in the other body, and any uh, major that was Bloomer's tax land gains tax would be okay because it was trying to modify behavior, not right, not make money. Okay, so cover the expenses. I'm looking. They are on their way. They are not here. They're right here. They're right here. Perfect time. So anyway, the tax bill, uh, the tax department asked for some scheduling and um, they wanted to be paid uh, their processing fee for the local option tax, which when the league was here, they said was fine with them. Um, but they will have to collect it and remit it. And, um, but there were technical corrections and I told Anthea to just <coughs> draft them up. This was just sinking like the regular reporting periods with their reporting periods, but just so we had something to look at. Um, and we'll find out if there was anything objectionable, but off the top of my head I didn't see anything that stood out. I think there's one thing that you'll be oh, interested in. Oh, okay. Aside from that, I think it'll be pretty mundane. There's one thing, all right. This last one. <laughs> it's a simple little bit. And I just it's wanted to check in with y'all. I'm pretty sure I did when I did the walkthrough, but y'all have a copy of this. I, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we do. It's in the file somewhere. There we go. Yeah. This okay. was a timeline I passed out when I did a walkthrough, but I just for the, yeah. record, for the record, Michelle's child, Office of Legislative Council. And then you have Dexter Cooper, Office of Legislative Council. And okay. um, we're taking a look at Draft 1.1, Senate Finance, uh, individual instance of amendment to S54, where we should have a copy. And I'm just going to talk just briefly uh, about the first instance of amendment. This is just a technical amendment. So something uh, changed that the Committee on Government Operations recommended to Committee on Judiciary that they incorporated into their uh, amendment was that uh, with regard to board appointments, that one, uh, the bill is introduced had two governor appointees. Senate of Ops recommended to the judiciary that it be one governor, one treasurer appointee, and that was changed, but there was uh, a provision in a, in a second 
uh, section where I forgot to just bring that through, and so this is just a technical change because okay. it was already approved there, and so I just wanted to catch it here rather than okay. to do it out on the floor. Better here. Okay. So um, I was planning on just walking through these one at a time. Yeah, that works with that's, me. That's great. Okay, so the second instance of amendment, the Department of Taxes requested that there be a specific definition section for Chapter 207, which is the new chapter on the cannabis taxes, both excise and local, in Title 32. All of the definitions are already defined terms, either in new title, new language to Title 7 or existing language in Title 32, except for, and on the um, amendment, I'm not going to go to page 2, um, subdivision 7, retail sale, is just a pared down version of the retail sale definition from the sales and use tax chapter in um, Title 32. Okay. And this will get slotted in if you're looking at your um, bill as amended by Senate Judiciary, um, at the sort of bottom of page 51, top of page 52. Okay. Then with the definition section. Okay. So the third um, amendment is doing two things. One, and I'll do the, the end of that first, is it's just pulling out where it previously had said as that term is defined in subdivision, et cetera, and is defined under 7 BSA. Pulling that out because since we now have a definition section, we don't need to cite back to the other. Um, okay. definitions. This is also leaving just as a placeholder in case you guys do want to change what the excise tax is. This would happen in this third instance of amendment where there are the question marks. So the question marks are ours to fill. All right. All right. Something above 10 or below 37. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's about, that's about <laughs> as precise as we can get. All right. The fourth amendment, um, and now if you're in your amended bill, is um, on page 53. We previously had said that one of the things that was exempt was sales for resale, but that's already now included in the retail sale definition that you have included in your definition section. Okay. And just to provide the utmost clarification, it has been swapped for the different sales that could happen between the licensees, your cultivator, your producer, your manufacturer before you get to the retail point. Okay. So this language in the fourth amendment and in the sixth amendment is the same because you have that language in both your excise tax section and your local option tax section. The sales, all right, so this accepts those sales from the excise tax. Correct. The excise tax will be collected once yep. at the final sale to the consumer. And, and it's just basically defining what is not the final sale. Yep. Right. And but I'm assuming that at some point there are going to be fees attached to these different and licensure and application and they'll pay. Yes. So they will be paying to have the license and right. one establishment could have multiple licenses of different types, but this is so there's not um, if you have someone who's growing that is then selling to someone who's going to do the rest of the process and turn it into cookies. Bakes the brownies. The cookie is what's taxed when it's sold to the actual consumer. Right. Similar to all other manufacturing. And similar to how we sort yeah. of treat our sales and use tax. Right. Or, or yes. But this um, is not a sales and use right. tax. No. Yeah. Yeah, Cannabis excise tax here. Right. Um, okay. The Fifth Amendment is again one of those where we're just pulling out um, as the term has been defined, since we don't need that, since we have a definition section. Okay. The seventh one is giving the Department of Taxes the ability to collect an administrative fee per return. The number that is in there now is $5.96, which is what's for the other local option tax. Um, I think the Department of Taxes is still trying to figure out if they can Five ninety six fee would cover that, but it would be on the monthly returns, and it would be deducted from what the municipalities would be getting back. Okay. There's also some language in here that the Department of Taxes wanted added in, which um, addresses the destination basis for taxation, which could come into play if there are deliveries in the future, <coughs> which is not something that this bill 
contemplates right. but they wanted that language in there to be clear. Yes. Just zip through the the uh, process processing fee. Um, that that's for the, the existing local option tax. The 596 is what is the administrative fee for the existing local option tax. We're just duplicating it here. But, but, but we're not duplicating the tax because the the amount to be raised is uh, is, is the same no matter where it takes place. And when right. the department came in for that fee, it was because some towns were taxed at this rate, other towns were at a different rate. And we gave them some money to deal with that so difference, but in this bill, there's no difference. There is no difference. That was what um, I think we heard testimony from the league as well on the 70 30 split. Right. This is only going to the municipality mm -hmm. where the local option tax is collected if there's a retail establishment. It is not then being divvied up to other municipalities. All this is doing, the only change this is doing is instead of having all of the money go back to the municipality with the retail sale. It's all the money less an administrative fee. But, but there's no sharing. What's the administrative fee for if there's Two. no split rate that they have to administer? Well, I understand okay. your question, and I think the Department of Taxes is probably better suited to say what is involved in their administrative costs. Uh, look, my, my memory was that, that, you know, let's say Montpelier has a, a retail outlet, mm -hmm. so the retail outlet remits the, the oh, whatever the it is monthly or to the tax department mm -hmm. and then the tax department has to do a calculation and send two percent of that back to the city of Montpelier so okay. that I'm, fee I'm, I'm mistaken because I thought yesterday's testimony was that the local option was whether or not they were going to sell it but now no, 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 we're no, if you vote to sell it in your town, then you get to keep yes. the two percent. It's yes. more like if you are selling it, right. then you get two percent. Okay. And so the I fee. Take, uh, my question goes away. Okay. It, you were and this is a previous the, behavior. Thank you. This is the same. Fee. It's unfortunate to call it the local option in a way because it is right. not <laughs> yeah, the same as what we well, think of as local. Yeah. The, the option is whether or not to sell. The other option is whether or not to tax. Yes. This yes. one, we're saying if you tell, this is the tax you will get. Right. Correct. Okay. Well, and it was changed to up to 2%, so right. a municipality could choose to have a lower, lower. cannabis if local this, option tax. So is this, this the is town so next door has a retail, we might have a little price war going on. Okay. So is the 70% share also in here? No. 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 Oh. So no. now we're back to it being different. No. There's no, the town that does it, it's not going into the pilot fund and being dispersed to the towns like the local option tax. This one, the town says yes, and they then get the right to do a local option tax. On, on marijuana. On marijuana. They do that tax, and they get to keep all of the money that is generated in their town by that tax. Except so, for five bucks. Except for five bucks. And that's bucks, what the, the bill the, before us. <coughs> right. And as the finance committee, do, would we like to weigh in on the policy of whether or not to send seventy percent to the other towns? We're not Iowa? sending seventy percent. Well, anyway. that's what he's asking. Well, no, do you want to send seventy percent? Well, that's we we decide stuff like that. Yeah. So I would like to send seventy percent. Like we to do who? with the sales tax. This isn't the sales tax. It, it's whatever we say. Okay. It is. I'm confused as and to where you. It's been drafted by someone. He doesn't who's like not having the, the, the other local option be charged in Montpelier, so his people pay it, and they don't get the benefit of it. But they do if they have a salt shed, because if you have any they state that. property, that gets paid out to those towns. That's been an ongoing issue for 20 years. Is it, uh, Ever since we've had a local option tax or collected money, okay. where, where the local towns get a share of that money, um, we, we also send another share to pilot. Yes. And yeah. that's a decision for us to decide whether we, we want can to do that or that. we don't. Right. right. Yeah. And whoever drafted the bill was. Is that a motion? Uh, pardon, I would move that we treat it you know, similarly. 
70 percentile. So. so they would only keep 30 percent minus five bucks, five nine six. Same as sales tax. I believe the testimony from the league is that they would like it shared equally. Or that that it not be divided up. I have a motion that sure, yeah. it, means, it means the town is going to keep all the money the way the bill is written. I, I'm not surprised. Not the league. That's of course that would be their position. They said it should go to all the town. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the seventy percent. But all the towns can vote. So I don't know. So. Can I just clarify? I just wanted to make sure. Can you help us? With yeah. Well, just I just wanted to remind people of the way that the that, that it works is is the the proposal the bill is introduced and the strike off from judiciary has municipalities have an opt out so automatically right. it's everybody can participate if a town chooses to say we are not going to allow a cannabis business in our in our town they yeah. have. Any kind. Right. It could be any cannabis establishment. So any oh, of the five licensees. Oh. So they can. So you could be a producer. Of you could right. So they could say we're fine with a cultivator, but we don't want a retailer. Okay. Or we're fine with a product manufacturer, but we don't want a farm. You know, whatever it is. And so they can choose and they can put that, but they would have to put that before the voters at an annual meeting or a special meeting. And so if they don't want to participate, they would have to have a vote to opt out and. and Therefore, prohibit, and that's the only way that they can prohibit um, a cannabis, a licensed cannabis establishment, from operating in the municipality. They can't do it through trying to use zoning or nuisance or bylaws or things like that. So they would have to have a vote to opt out. And so, if they opt out, the way that um, judiciary structured this was that if they choose to opt out, um, and they and the bills providing this opportunity for the local tax that it be put it and say we don't want to participate, then they should not share in the local local option revenue. But okay, if I vote to, to have farms and manufacturers, mm -hmm. but I don't want a retail establishment because the only one is across the street from my middle school, you know, the county store, and that's the one place that's available, do I share in the tax if I don't have retail sales? Mm -hmm. I didn't think so. But on the sales tax, you do. On the sales tax, you share in the tax if you have a state facility. So if there, well, you already get money if there's a state farm. So if the state has a garage or a salt shed or they own property in your town, you get a prorated share. Of the 70%. Of and, and you what get to if, keep 30 If No, you get to keep. Th that's another one. You get to keep, so I'll leave, swing this to South Burlington, but they have a local option yeah. tax. Mm -hmm. They keep 30%. They keep 30% of that extra 10 cents I pay mm -hmm. on the dollar. And 70% goes to the pilot. And 70% goes to all the other towns that have pilot. pilot. And they get it, the tax department gets it. Pilot for those that are uninitiated is payment in lieu of taxes. Right. So this bill doesn't share any of it. Right. Except for a little fee with the tax department. What has come to our the league has asked share. frankly to share with literally everything. Your motion is to share with pilot fund. The same as the sales tax. The same as what? The local The same options. as the local option sales tax. And those are Think to my mind the three things that have been discussed. Thank you. So that would be my. The motion is that the local option tax here be treated the same as any other local option tax, which is that if 30% would stay with the town and 70% would be shared with the pilot town. But that is not all towns. So is, in terms of this motion of the overall thing, is the 30% that an individual town keeps based upon 
the sales in that town? Yes. Yes, just like the sales tax. They keep 30. So what was the, the league was saying they want all, whether it's 30% or 100% of, of that 2% local tax, they want that all of that be collected and distributed to 240. Right, and I don't. Even if you don't have a retail, or you yeah. Right, yeah. Or Same anything. as the sales tax. No, the sales tax is not distributed to oh. all towns. The league said they wanted all towns to share in the benefit, but that was as far as it went. We don't have a mechanism set up right so now to do that. that. So that you, that would that would definitely require a higher fee from the tax department. Unless you piggyback the. What seems like it might be easier than going town by town as to what your collections are. They already, if you. We do that now. Well, that's what is suggested in the bill. Right? The bill suggests that all the in the bill, and I don't know if you were here for that part, the, any money the town raises stays in the town on that local option section. Yeah, but town by town. Town by town. So if you choose, this is an incentive to have an establishment. If you choose right. to have an establishment, you keep your local option tax, which you vote, and you have to vote out if you don't want to, you keep the 2%. Minus $5.96. Why can't we just say $6? <laughs> um, make their job easier. They make you round. Um, in, in a B2, the tax department, because they will collect all the taxes and send your 2% back to you. Maybe it's easiest to think about if you want to have a big incentive or a little bit of an incentive. I think we want a big incentive. Okay, I have a motion to treat this local option as we do to others, which means it would be divided 30-70 between the host town with the tax and 70% minus the $5.96 going to pilot would go into the pilot program. Which was reimbursed okay. the universities and the salt sheds. Right. Is there further discussion on that? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. no. Okay. And once again, the large towns will take the money and the small towns will be left there. Large towns have a lot of pilot. Actually, oh, okay. I think that I think the this biggest is place is going to be the small towns yeah, in the I Connecticut right River there. Valley because that's where it's not legal across the river. <laughs> All right. All right. So we're off that one. Eight. <laughs> So the eighth is the Department of Taxes requested, even though there is language in here saying that all of the sales and use tax provisions um, apply if they're not inconsistent, they wanted to specifically reference the penalties uh, section for sales and use tax. Which means if the you failed if I failed to send it in, they can do bad things to me. And that doesn't complicate the fact that we're not counting those as sales and use tax. No, it's just okay. the law. Okay. It's just so that you don't have to duplicate a lot of language for two They don't send theirs in, they get the same penalties if I don't send in my sales tax. Okay, yeah. so the Ninth Amendment, one is a pretty small administrative thing. Um, the tax department requested that um, the returns we do on the 25th day of the month so that it lined up with other taxes. It was previously the 15th day. And then this is the one that would be a change from what the bill has, which is it would specifically give the commissioner of taxes the ability to prohibit remittance in cash. So that, that would be an okay. addition. And I know they have brought that to us before. Um, Did we, there were no medical folks paying cash, were there? No. They have not had to set up a vault or arrange for army car deliveries. Um, so they I, do check and like 
Yeah, I think we heard there was at least one major financial institution that is statewide, yeah. pretty much, that you could get financial services from. You might have create, to open it up. I'm saying can we create a reflective deposit plan so that yes, the government changes that requirement and yes. creates a prohibition, which is not necessarily unlikely, no. to revert back to a requirement that banks cannot. Would it make sense to have a fallback position that doesn't have to come back to the legislature? If the federal government were to, if the government, federal government were to prohibit those institutions that are providing credit service or providing banking services from doing so, well, it's a may. Much more explicit. May require. May require. So, so it gives in that case, they may require. Right. 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 May prohibit the remittance. Yeah. So if the feds mm -hmm. made a change, they may <coughs> require. So if you've got one little money. mom and pop store Nobody. coming in with a couple hundred dollars mm -hmm. in an envelope. Mm -hmm. You're fine. Uh, it's just, it's just yeah. something that no, we no, always do. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Good yeah. point. Yeah. Went through that, so. Okay. Okay. Go. So the tenth one um, is just providing clarification, even though you know the rules of statutory interpretation, the specific would from the general. If there is a conflict with any of the other bundling transaction provisions applicable to another tax, because they have regulations on bundled transactions. This language would apply for the cannabis bundled transactions. Okay. What's a bundled transaction? Oh, this is like if you were going to buy a t shirt oh, and a cookie. Oh, okay. Got it. Uh, you're going to get the t shirt and, yeah. And they wouldn't right. say that the cookie Smoke cost a dollar and the t shirt cost $49. And right. then you're only getting the excise tax. Okay. So. Yes. All right. This is the keeping everybody on this base. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, um, the 11th one, this is, it looks like you're adding two sections, uh, subsection B already existed, and subsection A is just giving the commissioner <coughs> the um, authority to adopt rules through the Administrative Procedures Act. Okay. I thought well, he just had, he had that, <coughs> he's got overarching rulemaking authority anyway. Belts and suspenders, okay. That is the third time I've either used that today or heard that. <laughs> it was pretty standard around here for quite a while. That is what Michelle told me. Still is. So uh, 12th is another one where we're uh, striking out some as defined that we no longer need because we have a definition section. And then whenever you have, I'm on to the 13th Amendment, whenever you have an exemption, you need to justify or explain the expenditure, the not collecting, and since we changed the language of our exemption, change the language of the expenditure. So now it's saying you're avoiding taxing when purchased cannabis or cannabis product is intended to be incorporated into a new product. So that you're only taxing at that by sale point. Um, the 14th Amendment, even though we are exempting cannabis and cannabis products from all the other taxes, we're now specifically saying these are the only taxes that apply. It's the cannabis excise tax and the cannabis local option tax. Um, even though we're in uh, the sales and use tax section of Title um, 32, we're saying this doesn't apply to cannabis and cannabis products. We're specifically saying here, <coughs> these are the only taxes that apply to cannabis and cannabis products. So someone has sent the Finance Committee a bill that, that, that does not send money to the end fund. And that's what we're looking at now. This is saying in two different ways, yes. these are the only taxes that apply. We're saying all these other taxes don't apply, and we're saying these are the only two taxes that do apply. The end result of that is you're saying that the sales and use tax doesn't apply, no money is going to be added. Okay. Right. So but that would be something that we might want to weigh in on. It might be. So the inclusion of this language is not the only thing that is making money not go to the Ed Fund. What's making money not go to the Ed Fund is this language and the language that says it's exempt from the sales and use tax. We're just right. saying it's it is an excise tax. And that was done to, to make sure that the money goes to the general fund. And not the Ed fund. And not the Ed fund. 
don't do that, okay? Right. I think we get back I to the that. yeah to the concern that there is quite a prevention bill headed this way. We got our first look at it this morning. Um, that and it does look at this money, um, but that we want to make sure that there is enough the expenses if any, will hit the general fund. So this is the third bill we've had this year. Last year we set the rules for sales and use tax and percentage of the general fund. This is the third bill we've got this year, which notwithstanding last year's establishment yes. of the Ed Fund, begins to, is this becoming a pattern now? It's always a pattern. No, we used to have a general fund transfer right. year after year after year. Well, right, but then we put other things into the Ed Fund to pay. Correct. All right. Good. When there's not enough money, we find ways to manipulate. It's one of the things we do. You need to add it yeah. to your list. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tax regulate <laughs> manipulate. <laughs> Is there, um, of course, these businesses are subject to other taxes, withholding taxes. Yes. Yeah. That we don't worry. It's just the product itself. Yeah. yeah. And it's the only thing that applies to the retail sale. This is a new product. And we are choosing in this bill, by calling it an excise and not a sales and use tax, to ensure that the money from this new product will go into the general fund, at least for now. That does not mean that in the future, once we see what the costs and the revenues of this program turn out to be, that we might not go back to a sales tax. We play with the alcohol taxes on a fairly regular basis. We play with the cigarette taxes on an almost annual basis. Well, this, this is a yeah. sales tax. No, this is, so in the way in which the bill is written, it, it says it, it performs the function of notwithstanding last year's tax, we're not going to. Well, it's also a bigger number, right? It's not. Right. It's not just applying sales tax because sales tax is six percent. So we could if, add the six percent on top. In this draft, we have XXX for the sale for the for the tax, the total tax rate. We could do. The and you can. 10, Say six. six six percent of the XXX shall be sales tax, like we do for beer and the other things yes, we you do. Could, sales tax. Tax. So you could do the ten percent in the bill, do the six percent and up to a two percent local option. And we would still come in under twenty. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So that's the sixteen. So I'm sorry, yeah. Madam Chair, that's if you did that sixteen? 18, 18, 10, 6, and 2, right? Yep. I think I can still add. <coughs> I mean, it is. Or 8, I, I, and 6, and 2. I 18. hear what you're saying. I think there is a choice. Do you want to have some of this money go to the Ed Fund or not? And the choice currently is no, we do well, not. If you want to make We haven't it, said that yet. Well, that's People who drafted the bill have said that. Right. Well, that's and that's what we're discussing. Which so is what we yeah. I hear what you're saying about the structure from last year. If you want some money to go to the F fund, make the case. Six percent of the ex of the tax rate on cannabis should be sales tax, and the rest would not be. Is there a reason that the the drafters or presenters of this bill decided not to put a sales tax? They had to start somewhere. Okay, okay, but let them well, go. Well, I, I mean, I would say that. A couple of things. One is the reality of the Ed Fund with the Amazon tax and now the phase two of that marketplace, what do we call Wait, that? Marketplace. You know, we're, we're, we're seeing that change that was made last year come in uh, with higher revenue than maybe we expected. So there is not, there was not a motivation to further accelerate that impact on the Ed Fund. Um, the testimony in here last year, what appropriations asked us to make that, 
and this committee said, that looks like the Ed Fund is going to get squeezed and it's going to come in short. And the appropriation said, yes, it's going to come in short. But we're confident that the two things that you just mentioned will be there next year. So, and we did put rooms and meals in to make sure that it was as equal an exchange. However, even with that, the projections in November was for a flat tax rate, and that included, after, with our three-year rolling average, that the grand list was going up, which was a large part. If we did the 6%, arguably we might be able to lower property taxes. And with that <coughs> bad, the sales tax will go down. So... If but we, the internet, right. So, you know, I think it's a fair argument to have and, and a policy discussion to have whether, based, I would think of it as, do we want some of this money to be sort of slotted for the Ed Fund? That's not where I'm coming from. Right. Is, is there any other reason to do it? Is there any mechanical reason to apply the sales tax to to this as opposed to a, a bifurcated excise tax and a sales tax? I, I don't. Not that I'm aware of. But the question is, so do you want the money to go to the Ed Fund, yeah. or don't you? That's the question. Yeah, the I six agree. percent is set on the sales tax. So if we're going to do a different sales tax amount. I think that's why they went to an excise tax because it's not, it's greater right. than 6%. It allows you flexibility. Right. And remember, we're going to be learning things in the coming years before we collect a dime. Yep. And so if you. So then you could put a 6% sales tax on there, which is going to take effect. Yes, and we could learn in the upcoming year and we could change it. Absolutely. And you also, if you. you know, Given that sales tax means one thing, it means six percent, and it means go for two things, and to the Ed Fund, you're sort of locked into that. This allows more flexibility. Locks you out. One way locks us in, the other way locks us out. But when you choose an excise tax at the point of sale, you have a lot of flexibility of is it two percent, is it ten percent, is it eighteen percent? Okay, um, we're either you're going to send it to the Ed Fund or not. That's right. So that's the thing, and we'll see if the big towns will send it, and the small towns won't get it. We're back to the pattern. So. To the general fund. We're back to the pattern. Um, I don't big towns. Yes. think this has Sport. got anything to do with big towns or small towns. That's what the big towns always say when each time there's an opportunity to have the small towns send money to the big towns. That's what happens, and each time we're told that that wasn't the intention. It just happened. No okay. Sales tax, Committee. Option tax, the tips. Da, 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 da. All right. I don't think I've got a motion. Can I ask a yes. question? Yes. So talking about uh, opting in and opting out, is there any, if a town doesn't elect to opt, opt out, is there anything else? Do all zoning laws or permitting laws apply to a retail establishment and even a growing establishment as it would an ordinary legal business? Yes, uh, yes. They, have the, they have their authority, their inherent authority under Title 24 and to, to be able to, to regulate the way that they would other businesses. And in terms of the taxes, does the public have any idea when they buy the, what I think in a liquor store there's some on your bill or something that identifies the tax that's being applied to? Yeah, there's language in here that specifically says you need to put out both the excise tax and the local option tax, and they're separate. Okay. And was there any reason, I mean, the original draft of 10 and 2, was there any, like, discussion about who's doing the most work or what the money you know, would be needed for? I mean, I guess as an example, why would it be 11, 9, and 3, uh, if you're looking to do And working that with the original sponsors, and particularly with Senator Sears, and the way that he was envisioning it structured as introducing <coughs> and also as it came to you, is that, so the fees would be supporting the regulatory scheme solely, right. and that the tax revenue, he wasn't looking at as a, something um, kind of like a, 
like a windfall, but more that money, he was trying to set the rate at something that would then go into general fund and then appropriations could decide how to allocate that money to address things that might be impacts from from the from the industry. And that's so more, he was trying to, that's to pick a number. That's more articulate than what I was trying to say, but I was trying to say is the burden on the state envisioned to be proportional to that ten to two as opposed what are the what, what, are, the, what are the what, what are the responsibilities of the town that they're getting what added burden are they getting there that they're justifying one percent or two percent? I mean added traffic uh, and they did take testimony from from folks in, uh, in Massachusetts that have it, from step boards, they, their testimony was that they really weren't seeing any impacts at this point other than some uh, addressing some parking issues uh, with their dispensaries. Um, but uh, I think, I don't know, I think you probably would, would, would want to speak with the sponsors directly about okay. that. I think it, the bills introduced was a 1% local option and Senate government operations recommended to judiciary to increase it to up to two, so to give them a little more leeway so they could uh, have a little bit of a higher tax that if they wanted to. A, that was another question. So in the bill, yeah. it says up to two, you can have varying local option rates in the state? Yes. And that's a government operation? That was a recommendation from government operations to judiciary, and they included it into their amendment. Is that more of their jurisdiction or yours? The local ordinances and zoning would be at GovOps, yeah. We just raise money. And if we, so we can go, we've got the tax rate, which as a placeholder of 10, excise, pure and simple, going to the general fund, that's the proposal and it's up to a 2% local option. We can change any one of those rates. We can say, no, we wanna do the regular sales tax, but that would take any money out of the general fund, which needs it. Um, we could choose to just say, as we do with alcohol, there will be a local, a, an excise tax mm -hmm. and there will be a sales tax and many other states do that. We wanted to come in below Massachusetts which is at 20%, this gets us to 18 if we do all of that, um, which is not as below as other people would like us to be below but it's below. Is the local option tax a variable tax around the state right now? Um, well, it doesn't exist in every municipality. Well, I know, but where it does. I believe it is just 1%. Yes. And then there's the meals and rooms tax. What is the we have? We have flexibility. Like, uh, I feel like Burlington has a higher it's, restaurant. It's it's oh, but your, but your, your, Burlington is the exception. When, tr trust me, <coughs> as Montpelier tried to do this 20 some, think, think over South, 22 years I think ago. South Burlington's trying to do it right now. Well, right? South Burlington, yeah, but Burlington in their original charter had the right to regulate places of victual. And they therefore, that was interpreted that they could do rooms and meals taxing. The city of Montpelier's charter did not make that reference, so we had to go through a charter change, which for 18 years, so the big cities do lose sometimes, never even got a hearing in this body. Um, so Burlington is different. I believe the state law, when we did the state, the school property tax, that's when the argument that, well, we were taking some of the town's taxing power, because that was all they controlled. The state was taking <coughs> that, we should share some of ours. And that's when this somewhat limited ability of towns, um, it started out with only towns that were paying into the Ed Fund could do it. But I think that just limits it 
to no more than one. It's it's limited to one percent. I, I don't know that anyone's gone to a half percent or three quarters of them. One's just easier. I think that's where we are. And I don't. I haven't heard of any variability. Maybe in rooms in meals and alcohol there is, but I haven't heard of any in sales tax. They're two different taxes. Committee. What should, I've already canceled hemp for the day. Um, <laughs> figuring that we're not, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but we're not gonna get through this in time. And we, I don't think hemp is gonna, I just canceled yeah. about two minutes ago. <laughs> we're not gonna get more through that. Um, I have a question. How do other yeah. people feel about variable local option taxes? I think that gets confusing to do that. Like one town, two percent, other town, to who? And confusing to who? What's that? Who is that confusing to? Me. <laughs> Are you going to be basing your consumption on the local portion of the tax? Well, I have to test how much my, my Tesla gets in terms of mileage. I don't want to drive to say that 1%. And I just don't know why we have so many yeah, the different. Uh, I, but I thought this was set at 2%. Oh, oh it's up to 2%. Two. So your local town. They're all going to take 2%. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you? So then let's just say 2%. We can do that. Okay. I think uh, because Massachusetts sets up to yeah. 3%. State, town to town. So bad. I know that. In New York City, yeah. you got a state sales tax, and then you have a, well, you got right. a county sales tax, and then you have a New York City sales yeah. tax, and you get three <laughs> tiers. Yeah. We have not done that in a while. And in the recent 10, 15 years, since that 60, the large towns have begun to do that. And the large towns can't because they have the votes. And every time they do it, um, they always have a reason for doing it. But that's what the big towns do. Little towns How are you defining big towns? Uh, why is that an injustice? I don't know. A lot I don't of know people that. from the surrounding area come and use services in Montpelier. There's a burden to Montpelier. Same problem. You will jumpstart your and heart. Pilot funds that burden. No. 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 Pilot makes no. up for the no. pittance of so tax dollars that Montpelier gets because they host all this public land, public infrastructure. Then, okay. We're having you a different You argument. have the votes to do this. Okay. And each time the local okay. small communities can't compete, each time you vote to do it, it makes them even more difficult to compete. What, we're getting more. Okay, we're That's off. We're on. off. We're off of that subject. Okay, That's that is pilot, and that is not this discussion. The discussion here is uh, what tax <coughs> are we going to put on cannabis? Are we going to put an excise tax, and how much? Are we going to do a local option tax, and how much? And are we going to do any other tax? such as the sales tax on this. And we've been talking about 10, 2, and 6 in that order, right? Yes. The well, sales tax be, is new today. The bill has got the 10 and 2. We've also discussed wanting to come in lower. Than Massachusetts. Because we want, well, we, we also want to cut out the black market. I right. think there's, so I'm not going to say that. that, the illegal market. So you go 862 so um, and you're down to 16. What about the small towns? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, I'm just joking. Just write that for the record. So, can we take them one at a time and talk about should it be two or up to two or just one? I do. All right. I it makes Michael, two, Michael, right? well, can I get your vote if you get two? I don't know. I vote on two. I'm just trying to make the motion. I'm just trying to make the motion on that. 
Okay, let's do a straw poll. Do we want to just say a local option tax of two? Yes. All right. Why not? There was one on enthusiasm. Well, I, I, you know, one of, one of the things I, and, and you'll hear me say this a lot, I'm in a different place with you on the sales tax. Of course. Not, no, not because of, of course, because I don't think just because we put the sales tax to the education fund, if there's a big change in the scope of that tax that we have to be locked in right. to give a certain percentage to the education fund. That's a policy, and I'm sorry, we may have to not withstand. But we have all these new things we didn't expect, and that shouldn't just enrich the education fund. Well, I, I will point out, we are not lowering tax rates yet, so the education fund is arguably not enriched. It's, it's, it has really nothing to do with this. Okay, it doesn't. It's a theory. It doesn't. The question is... It, has to do it only has something to do with the bill. This, the bill doesn't include it. Since this since bill has a 10% excise tax. Similar, we have an excise tax on alcohol. We also have a sales tax on alcohol. So your option is we just do not put a sales tax on. We put a 6% sales tax because that is a set amount. I don't think we want to have different sales tax amounts and we will be like the big cities. Um, or do I think the big question right now is, if we add the sales tax, then 6% of these sales, an additional 6%, will go to the Ed Fund. It will keep the general fund whole, as per the uh, other bill, and we, bar we could go back to the original 1% in local option tax and just say that. Um, I'm feeling consensus around 10, 2, and 6 myself, but I could be misreading people about just 18 No, no I got ago. one no, and I got, I'm, I'm not sure, I got one heartburn here. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can make, if you want to go to 16, you build from within, if you want to go from below, with 6, you're up to 18%, so, but that's a choice. I, yes. I, I'm, I'll say, I don't see a particular burden on the Ed Fund from this policy. There is, some have argued, a health benefit or a health burden that comes out of the general fund. Some would argue there is a law enforcement implication that comes out of the general fund. I, I, until you tell me what schools are going to change based on having this, I'm not interested in it going to that fund. I think there's a lot of integrity of fact for it not to go to that. And I, I'm sorry, I thought that you were talking about it fund just to enhance you know, educational opportunities, things like that. I didn't know that there was a nexus being made between. There, because uh, I don't see. There, I agree with Senator Pearson. I fully agree with Senator Pearson. Yeah, that. I no, don't see the. There isn't, and the there isn't with anything fund. else that goes into the Ed Fund that there's a burden on the Ed Fund from this. So I, would, I would go with the six percent sales tax, provided that doesn't go to the Ed Fund. <laughs> well, that's sort of what we're doing with the excise. That's my theory. Right. What is it? I mean, so let's cool. just do the excise tax. Right. At 16 percent. Right. No, the excise no, tax is at 10. And they, we had well, talked about raising it, perhaps, mm -hmm. because 10 is exceptionally low. Maybe. He's nationally. proposing to make it 16. Is that correct? Well, I just, you know, if we're trying to get to about 18, if that's a, a number that we've been thinking about, then you no. Have a, okay. The question is, we we would be the lowest in the nation on on total tax okay. if we go with the 10 and the two. The next lowest is Massachusetts, which is also the closest, which is at 20. I personally haven't fought the property tax wars in this room for many years, would not mind. Nothing says it wouldn't be a good thing to lower or make it possible to lower property taxes. By, the, by, doing, this. by doing the sales tax, but I'm not I understand the other arguments, um, and this bill has a long way to go. We yeah. just have a quick have question of Senator Sorokin. You're opposed to the, it going to the Ed Fund, and ask why. So, I was trying to pull apart a little bit. Oh, yeah. 
probably hasn't kind of explained it well enough. My opposition is to what we did last year if people believe that every major change we did in terms of sales, mm -hmm. like the Amazon, oh. and the, that brings in millions and millions mm -hmm. of dollars. It changes the amount of money. There's a big bump to the end fund. Mm -hmm. Is not what I envisioned. That that we're locked into uh, that every dollar of the sales tax, no matter what happens to the sales tax, goes to the end fund. And this is a new, potentially very yeah. valuable resource to the state of Vermont. And I don't want to be locked in by that yeah. word. I can see can you know, the, the normal, the normal up and down yeah. of the sales tax from year to year. Fine, but if you get a whole new thing like Sir Brock and I have this. Uh, um, you know, that's the, that's the treasure. No, on the rooms and meals tax that we raised from VRBO, you know, the joint fiscal comes back and there's like $4 million in the out year. They're taking 25% out of that and for uh, education fund or something like that. And oh, so, that was the rooms and meals uh, uh, that went in to make sure that there was fun. enough money. That can come out. We could change that. If you I just would don't like. want. I don't think what we did last year should tie our hands when there's a big change. It in doesn't. The, case. the question, though, right now is there is no sales tax. If you put a sales tax on, you will be benefiting the Ed Fund. If you if you want to make more money for the general fund to do things you would like to do. Then you up the excise tax. Right, right. My, my argument is. So, theory. what's your it's motion? A, it's a theoretical argument. Yes. The answer to it is just to do the excise tax. Madam Chair, okay. what would you like to yes. Madam Chair. Yes. When the, in the 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, when appropriations, excuse me, appraisals were going up, the Ed Fund was generating yes. more money than it, than it had been in a couple of years. And when Act 60 passed, 80% of Vermonters paid their school education taxes based on their income on the houses, on the houses they lived in, yes. they paid based on income. And the thrift, the, the top rate for paying based on income was $75,000. And we used some of the additional revenues because the 80% of people who paid based on income had shrunk to the low 60s and was continuing to shrink year after year. Income and we took problem. some of the, with the increased revenues from the property tax, and we went back to the 80% of our modern paying their school taxes based on income. And today, um, in, the, in, the, in the demonstration we had here yesterday morning, we're back down to about two thirds of our modern pay their local education taxes right. based on income. Not 80%, yeah. now it's only back 67%. If the and each year, the number of people who pay based on income shrinks as the as our the overall income is going up. And we don't make an adjustment on the seventy-five thousand went up to ninety thousand, ninety thousand with a cliff. And we're going to squeeze the people who pay based on income and make them throw them off the formula if we right. don't make some changes. And the way you make changes is when you have some extra income. I think the short of it is that we could the end fund could use that extra money. So and then you go uh, back to have 80% of people in Vermont, working folks, would pay their school taxes based on their income. Again, on the house situation. Okay. Would it be helpful if we, if we've locked in 2% local, would it be helpful for us to land on a total tax of 18% or whatever and then to inform if there's a division among that. See how we divide that. it up. Okay, so what's the argument for the low tax? Why 10? Well, I'm looking at you, Senator Pearson, because he's just a well, sponsor. Just uh, yeah, I think it was in part a reaction to the 26% that the Governor's Commission came out with and, and wanted to say, that seems a little high. You know, here's another alternative, and figure that you kind of okay. wrestle it out. And so it's it not set in cement. It is far from set in cement. It's All right. Barely inked in. So the total tax, given that we want to 
see if we can't discourage illegal sales or purchases and that we want to be competitive. Our nearest neighbor and the lowest in the country is at 20 total. And that's, I think, sales, local option, and some excise, some mix. It's, in the, it's on so the thing. So to get us off the dock, should I make a motion? Please. I'll be ready, yeah. yeah. So I hear two people say 18%. I say 16% excise tax, 2% local option tax. What was your proposal? 16% excise tax, 2% local option tax. That gets to your 18 for you. Both of you are talking about 18%. To her and trade her for a glass of water. This thing was not going to be so good. I was like, she was out. She was in her mind. Her husband was in her mind. Right, right. She said, no. Get your email. It's okay. I'm going to see you. Reflective health benefits and yes, we yesterday. We walked through it yesterday, and we put it on for vote yesterday. And is there further discussion, amendments? This is our be prepared in case the feds do something again. Senator Schrocken has been quite passionate about this issue. Is he around? I okay. don't I, I, know. And the question was whether to extend the sunset set for two years no, no, or no, just no, no, remove it. No, 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 no. This is, that will be voted out. I'm reporting that tomorrow. <coughs> this is the reflective plans for when they do away with silver loading. Okay, we've got to get the right voting sheet. Reflective plans. Yes. Silver. 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 And what this does is Gets it says that we're going to stay on still reloading as long as we're allowed to, but if the feds say we can't, which would be for the 2021 budget, but those plans, plans, those plans are already, you know, will be submitted a year from now. So this would say, if that happens, then the cost will get spread over the silver and bronze plans, and that there will be reflective plans for those that don't qualify for a subsidy. All right. Is there any discussion? Is there a motion? Is it an amendment? No. no. It's just a straight it up. It is a straight oh, up. The right the first time. They got it right the first time. I move we vote S89 favorably. Okay. Senator Pearson has motioned that we vote S89 favorably. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Aye. Opposed say no. Okay, that is 601. Okay. Everybody likes this. Well, the advocates like it. I don't have to like. Yes, yes. If, you have to, if you have to do something, I you don't want to. I by saying it is a less objectionable yes, than yes. alternative. Yes. <laughs> I, I, if we I have to do something bad, this is the best bad we can do. All right. And the reporter. Please. They are literally on their way. They are literally on their way. I have had further discussions with Senator Kitchell. They're still a little iffy about whether or not uh, they need to have fees put in this bill. Oh, S89. I got more? A reporter. Oh, a reporter. Yes, who wants to report? We're rocking. I did that once to Welch, and it was a yes. And I voted against it, so I couldn't report it. No one else wanted to report it, so we made him report. Is he here? Who? Yes. He is around. He's not here. Yay! No, I. He he had issues. I'll report this. Oh, you're, good. you are crushing my mellow man. I know, I know. Okay, that one's done. Thank you. So anyway, uh, Stephanie's done some work on pricing out the board. We know there's money in the fee fund <coughs> from medical marijuana. If we start looking at all those yeah, yeah. listings of yeah. fees in all those other towns, this bill will not come out of here. Not by crossover. So what I told them was, we can decide on the tax rate. We will vote it out. They can look at it, but they will have it to look at. They can price out the board because there's proposals to change the size and the salaries and decide how much money they need. And then if they feel they need to be put in there, tell us, and I think they'll know that by the first part of next week, and we can then work on doing a floor amendment with the fee, um, with fees, but the bill will be moving and we'll make it, because this is one that the other body has never done a tax and regulate bill. <clears throat> we have. They've done a just make it legal bill. Oh, so they never. They but never they have. Done tax they they never have done never. A consumer safety bill. They've never done a consumer safety bill. So we think they're going to need some time to think this through, and we will see what they. Can they also have. have a lot of new members too. Yes. Who will need to know this? So that right now is the moving it forward plan. Um, Stephanie can tell us some of the pricing she has put on it, but uh, it's whether or not the money people over there, how much surety they need to make the interdepartmental, what is it, payment in anticipation of revenue. Just, just a procedural question is since you know we're talking about tax here yes. in the bill that we've got, should that originate in the House rather than here? We went through this last yeah, year I, I, and I remember last time this I asked that same question and Bloomer told me that in a way the tax is incidental to the program. So it is it is a Consumer safety. It is a regulation program that has a tax in it. It is not. I mean, in public parlance, it's always referred to as tax and regulate. Tax sure. is always put first. Sure, but that yes. has been his ruling. Yeah. Uh, and, and this came yeah. up with opioids or something. It came, came up, up on last this, this year. issue because we, yeah. we did it last year. And right. I think it's revenue bills, and it's how you mm -hmm. how you define revenue bills. The budget definitely has to start in the other body. And any major that was tax. Land gains tax would be okay 
because it was trying to modify behavior, not, right. not make money. Okay. So. Cover the expenses. I'm and working. They are on their way. They are not here. They're right here. They're right here. Perfect time. So anyway, the tax bill, uh, the tax department asked for some scheduling and um, they wanted to be paid uh, their processing fee for the local option tax, which when the league was here, they said was fine with them. Um, but they will have to collect it and remit it. And, um, but there were technical corrections, and I told Anthea to just <coughs> wrap them up. This was just sinking like the regular reporting periods with their reporting periods, but just so we had something to look at. Um, and we'll find out if there was anything objectionable, but uh, off the top of my head, I didn't see anything that stood out. I think there's one thing that you'll be oh, interested okay. in. Oh, okay. Aside from that, I think it'll be pretty mundane. There's one thing, all right. Hey, this last one. <laughs> it's a simple little bit. I just wanted to check in with y'all. I'm pretty sure I did when I did the walkthrough, but y'all have a copy of this. I, we do. Yeah, we do. It's in the file somewhere. Yeah. This is okay. the timeline I passed out when we did a walkthrough, but I just did a walkthrough. For the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel. And then we have the Cooper, Office of Legislative Counsel. We're taking a look at draft 1.1. Senate Finance, uh, individual instance of amendment to S54. Everybody should have a copy. And I'm just gonna talk just briefly uh, about the first instance of amendment. This is just a technical amendment. So something uh, changed that the Committee on Government Operations recommended to Committee on Judiciary that they incorporated into their uh, amendment was that uh, with regard to board appointments, that one, uh, the bill is introduced had two governor appointees. Senate of Ops recommended to the judiciary that it be one governor, one treasurer appointee, and that was changed, but there was uh, a provision in a, in a second uh, section where I forgot to just bring that through, and so this is just a technical change because okay. it was already approved there, and so I just wanted to catch it here rather than okay. do it out on the floor. Better here, okay. So um, I was planning on just walking through these one at a time, yep. if that works with that's, me. That's great. Okay, so the second instance of amendment, the Department of Taxes requested that there be a specific definition section for Chapter 207, which is the new chapter on the cannabis taxes, both excise and local, in Title 32. All of the definitions are already defined terms, either in new title, new language to Title 7, or existing language in Title 32, except for and on the um, amendment on page two, um, subdivision seven retail sale is just a pared down version of the retail sale definition from the sales and use tax chapter in um, Title 32. Okay. And this will get slotted in if you're looking at your um, bill as amended by Senate Judiciary. Um, at the sort of bottom of page 51, top of page 52. Okay. Then with the definition section. Okay. So the third um, amendment is doing two things. One, and I'll do the, the end of that first, is it's just pulling out where it previously had said as that term is defined in subdivision, et cetera, and is defined under 7 BSA. Pulling that out because since we now have a definition section, we don't need to cite back to the other. Um, definitions. This is also leaving just as a placeholder in case you guys do want to change what the excise tax is. This would happen in this third instance of amendment where there are the question marks. So the question marks are ours to fill. All right. All right. Something above 10 or below 37. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's, about, that's about as <laughs> precise as we can get. All right. The fourth amendment, um, and now if you're in your amended bill, is um, on page 53, 
We previously had said that one of the things that was exempt was sales for resale, but that's already now included in the retail sale definition that you have included in your definition section. Okay. And just to provide the utmost clarification, it has been swapped for the different sales that could happen between the licensees, your cultivator, your producer, your manufacturer, before you get to the retail point. Okay. So this language in the Fourth Amendment and in the Sixth Amendment is the same because you have that language in both your excise tax section and your local option tax section. The sales, all right, so this accepts those sales from the excise tax. Correct. The excise tax will be collected once yep. at the final sale to the consumer. And, and it's just basically defining what is not the final sale. Yep. Right. And but I'm assuming that at some point there are going to be fees attached to these different and licensure and application and they'll pay. Yes. So they will be paying to have the license and right. one establishment could have multiple licenses of different types, but this is so there's not um, if you have someone who's growing that is then selling to someone who's going to do the rest of the process and turn it into cookies. Bakes the brownies. The cookie is what's taxed when it's sold to the actual consumer. Right. Similar to all other manufacturing. And similar to how we sort of yeah. treat our sales and use tax. Right. Or, or yes. But this um, is not a sales and use right. tax. No. Yeah. Yeah. Canvas excise tax here. Right. Um, okay. The Fifth Amendment is again one of those where we're just pulling out um, as the term has been defined since we don't need that since we have a definition section. Okay. The seventh one is giving the Department of Taxes the ability to collect an administrative fee per return. The number that is in there now is $5.96, which is what's for the other local option tax. Um, I think the Department of Taxes is still trying to figure out if they can 596 fee would cover that, but it would be on the monthly returns and it would be deducted from what the municipalities would be getting back. Okay. There's also some language in here that the Department of Taxes wanted added in, which um, addresses the destination basis for taxation, which could come into play if there are deliveries in the future, <coughs> which is not something that this bill contemplates, right. but they wanted that language in there to be clear. Uh, yes. Just zip through the the uh, process processing fee. Um, that that's for the, the existing local option tax. Right? The five ninety six is what is the administrative fee for the existing local option tax? We're just duplicating it here. But, but, but we're not duplicating the tax because the the amount to be raised is uh, is is the same no matter where it takes place. And when right. the department came in for that fee, it was because some towns were taxed at this rate, other towns were at a different rate. And we gave them some money to deal with that so difference. But in this bill, there's no difference. There is no rate. difference. That was what, um, I think we heard testimony from the league as well on the 70-30 split. Right. This is only going to the municipality mm -hmm where the local option tax is collected if there's a retail establishment. It is not then being divvied up to other municipalities. All this is doing, the only change this is doing is instead of having all of the money go back to the municipality with the retail sale, it's all the money less an administrative fee. But, but there's no share. What's the administrative fee for if there's Two. no split rate that they have to administer? I understand your question, and I think the Department of Taxes is probably better suited to say what is involved in their administrative costs. Uh, so my my memory was that that you know, let's say Montpelier has a, a retail outlet, mm -hmm. so the retail outlet remits the, the oh, whatever the it is monthly or to the tax department, mm -hmm. and then the tax department has to do a calculation and send. 2% of that back to the city of Montpelier. So okay. that I'm, fee. I'm, I'm mistaken because I thought yesterday's testimony was that the local option was whether or not they were going to sell it. But now no, 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 we're no. saying if you vote to sell it in your town, then you get to keep yes. the 2%. It's yes. more like if you are selling it, right. then you get 2%. Okay. 
and so the I fee. Take my question goes away. Okay. You were copying and this is a previous behavior. Thank you. This is the same. Fee. It's unfortunate to call the local option in a way because it is right. not right. yeah, the same as what we well, think of as local. Yeah, the, the option is whether or not to sell. The other option is whether or not to tax. Yes. This yes. one we're saying if you tell, this is the tax you will get. Right. Correct. Okay. Well, and it was changed to up to 2%, so right. a municipality could choose to have a lower, lower. cannabis if local this, option tax. So is this, is the this town safe? next door has a retail, we might have a little price war going on. Okay. So is this 70% share also in here? No. 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 Oh. So no. we're back to it being different. No. There's no, the town that does it, it's not going into the pilot fund and being dispersed to the towns like the local option tax. This one, the town says yes, and they then get the right to do a local option tax. On, on marijuana. On marijuana. They do that tax, and they get to keep all of the money that is generated in their town by that tax. Except for five bucks. Except for five and bucks. And that's what the that bill before us. <laughs> right. And as the finance committee, do, would we like to weigh in on the policy of whether or not to send 70 percent to other towns. We're not private. sending 70 percent. Well, anyway. that's what he's asking. Well, no, do you want to send 70 percent? Well, that's we we decide stuff like that. Yeah, so I would like to send 70 percent, like we do with the sales tax. This isn't the sales tax. It, it's whatever we. Okay. I'm confused as and to where it's been you drafted by someone. He doesn't like not having the, finance the other local option be charged in Montpelier, so his people pay it, and they don't get the benefit of it. But they do if they have a salt shed, because if you have any Maybe state that. property, that gets paid out to those towns. That's been an ongoing issue for 20 years. Is it, uh, ever since we've had a local option tax or collected money okay. where, where the local towns get a share of that money um, we, we also send another share to pilot yes and yeah. that's a decision for us to decide whether we, we want to do that or that. we don't right yeah. and whoever drafted the bill was is that a motion pardon i would move that we treat it you know, similar and that we send 70 percent to pilot so, so they don't only keep 30 percent minus five bucks, five ninety six. Same as sales tax. I believe the testimony from the league is that they would like it shared equally, that, that, that it not be divided up. I have a motion that shared equally yeah. means it means the town is going to keep all the money the way the bill is written. I, I'm not surprised. Not the league. That's, of course that would be their position. They said it should go to all the towns. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the 70 percent. But all the towns can vote. So I don't know. So can I just clarify? I just we wanted to, to help us with yeah. well, just I just <laughs> wanted to remind people of the way that the that, that it works is is the, the proposal of the bill is introduced and the strike off from judiciary has municipalities have an opt out. So automatically right. it's everybody can participate. If a town chooses to say we are not going to allow a cannabis business in our in our town, they have well, any kind. Right. It could be any cannabis establishment. So any oh, of the five licensees. Oh. So they can. So you could be a producer. You could right. So they could say we're fine with a cultivator, but we don't want a retailer. Okay. Or we're fine with a product manufacturer, but we don't want a farm. You know, whatever it is. And so they can choose and they can put that, but they would have to put that before the voters at an annual meeting or a special meeting. And so if they don't want to participate, they would have to have a vote to opt out and, and therefore prohibit, and that's the only way that they can prohibit um, a cannabis, a licensed cannabis establishment from operating in the municipality. They can't do it through trying to use zoning or nuisance or bylaws or things like that. So they would have to have a vote to opt out. And so if they opt out, the way that um, judiciary structured this was that if they choose to opt out, um, and, and the bill is providing this opportunity for the local tax that if we 
put it and say we don't want to participate, then they should not share in the local local option revenue. But obviously, you can okay. If I changes. vote to have farms and manufacturers, mm -hmm. but I don't want a retail establishment because the only one is across the street from my middle school, you know, the county store, and that's the one place that's available. Do I share in the tax if I don't have retail sales? Mm -hmm. I didn't think so. But on the sales tax, you do. On the sales tax, you share in the tax if you have a state facility. So if there, well, you already get money if there's a state farm. So if the state has a garage or a salt shed or they own property in your town, you get a prorated share. Of the 70%. Uh, and, and you what, get to yeah. keep third. If no, huh? you get to keep. The, th that's another one. You get to keep. The, so I'll leave swing this to South Burlington, but they have a local option yeah. tax. Mm -hmm. They keep thirty. They keep thirty percent of that extra ten cents I pay mm -hmm. on 70 the dollar. Seventy percent goes to pilot. And seventy percent goes to all the other towns that have pilot. Pilot. And they get it. The tax department gets it. Pilot for those return. that are uninitiated is payment in lieu of taxes. So this bill doesn't share any of it. Right. Except for a little fee with the tax department. He, what has come to our The league has asked share. Yeah. Frankly, to share with literally everything. Your motion is to share with pilot fund. The same as the sales tax. The same as what? The local The same options. as the local option sales tax. And those are, I, I think, to my mind, the three things that have been discussed. Thank you. So that would be my. The motion is that the local option tax here be treated the same as any other local option tax, which is that if 30% would stay with the town and 70% would be shared with the pilot towns. But that is not all towns. So is, in terms of this motion of the overall thing, is the 30% that the individual town keeps based upon the sales in that town? Yes. Yes, just like the sales tax. They keep 30. So what was the, the league was saying they want all, whether it's 30% or 100% of, of that 2% local tax, they want that all of that be collected and distributed to 200 Right, and I don't. Even if you don't have a retail, yeah. you don't right. have yeah. Yeah. Or Same anything. as the sales tax. No, the sales tax is not distributed to oh. all towns. The league said they wanted all towns to share in the benefit, but that was as far as it went we don't have a mechanism set up right so now to do that. that. So that that would that would definitely require a higher fee from the tax department. Unless you piggyback the What seems item. like it might be easier than going town by town as to what your collections are. They already if you we do that now. Well that's what is suggested in the bill. The bill suggests that all the in the bill, and I don't know if you were here for that part, the any money the town raises stays in the town on that local option section. Yeah, but town by town. Town by town. So if you choose this is an incentive to have an establishment. If you choose to have an establishment, you keep your local option tax, which you vote, and you have to vote out if you don't want to, you keep the 2%. Minus $5.96. Why can't we just say $6? <laughs> um, make their job easier. They make you round. Um, in, in a B2, the tax department because they will collect all the taxes and send your two percent back to you. Maybe it's easiest to think about if you want to have a big incentive or a little bit of an incentive. I think we want a big incentive. Okay, I have a motion to treat this local option 
as we do to others, which means it would be divided 30-70 between the host town with the tax and 70% minus the $5.96 going to pilot would go into the pilot program. Which was reimbursed okay. the universities and salt sheds. Right. Is there further discussion on that? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. Okay. And once again, the large towns will take the money and the small towns will be left there. Large towns have a lot of pilot. Actually, I think that I think the this biggest is place is going to be the small towns yeah, in the I Connecticut right River there. Valley, because that's where it's not legal across the river. <laughs> all right, all right. So we're off that one. Eight. <laughs> so the eight is the Department of Taxes requested. Even though there is language in here saying that all of the sales and use tax provisions um, apply if they're not inconsistent. They wanted to specifically reference the penalties uh, section for sales and use tax. Which means if the you failed as I failed to send it in, they can do bad things to me. And that okay. doesn't complicate the fact that we're not counting this as a sales and use tax? No, it's just okay. the law. Okay. It's just so that you don't have to duplicate a lot of language for to If they don't send theirs in, they get the same penalties if I don't send in my sales tax. Okay, yeah. so the Ninth Amendment, one is a pretty small administrative thing. Um, the tax department requested that um, the returns be due on the 25th day of the month so that it lined up with other taxes. It was previously the 15th day. And then this is the one that would be a change from what the bill has, which is it would specifically give the commissioner of taxes the ability to prohibit remittance in cash. So that, that would be an okay. addition. And I know they have brought that to us before. Um, Did we, there were no medical folks paying cash, were there? No. They have not had to set up a vault or arrange for army car deliveries. Um, so they I, do check. Yeah, I think we heard there was at least one major financial institution that is statewide, pretty much, that you could get financial services from. You might have to open it up. And they're saying can we create a reflective deposit plan so that yes, the federal government you changes it. that requirement and yes. creates a prohibition, which is not necessarily unlikely. No. To revert back to a requirement that banks cannot, would it make sense to have a fallback position that doesn't have to come back to the legislature? If the federal government were to, if the government, federal government were to prohibit those institutions that are providing credit service or providing banking services from doing so, well, it's a may, much more explicit. May require. May require. So, so in it gives that case, they may require. Right. Right. May prohibit the remittance. Yeah. So if the feds may have changed, they may require. So if you've got one little mom and pop store coming in with a couple hundred dollars in an envelope, you're fine. Uh, it's just, it's just yeah. something that no, we always do. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Good point. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the tenth one um, is just providing clarification, even though you know the rules of statutory interpretation, the specific would trump the general. If there is a conflict with any of the other bundling transaction provisions applicable to another tax, because they have regulations on bundled transactions, this language would apply for the cannabis bundled transactions. Okay. What's a bundle trip? Oh, this is oh, like man. if you were going to buy a t shirt oh, and a Oh, okay, cookie. got it. Okay, yeah. Okay. I'm dealing with small electric, so that would start with yours and then see what you would. Okay, trying to achieve. So, uh, for the record, uh, Senator Spring, Madison County, I'm uh, here to speak about S91. Um, happily, uh, co sponsors in the room, so keep, keep an eye out for us. Um, the, the thrust of S91 was really, well, I know you, the committee had, I believe, um, Christine Alford and 
yep. a week or two ago. Yep. So Tom well, you've had a lot of I guess, in the general conversation already about mm -hmm. the challenge. And um, when I was on this committee before, I did a fair amount of work on telecom and sort of the telecom authority. And I would just say this, all that work um, we have a, sort of a frustrating record of progress, non progress. This chair over Since here, if you want to move it. Um, which has all been corroborated just lately by the statewide drive that revealed how much feebler the service is than anyone had hoped. So the basically this is just uh, rather than assert that we know how to do this, it asks uh, the legislature to require the Commission of Department of Public Service to study the feasibility of uh, asking electric companies to provide broadband internet access service using electric distribution and transmission infrastructure. And then there's a, a short list here of things that might be part of such a feasibility study, including the maturity of the technology, the compatibility of uh, broadband internet access service with existing electrical service, looking at the bottom of page one, the financial investment required uh, energy provision, uh, identification of unserved and underserved areas of the state, um, impact on electric rates, financial risk of electric companies. So um, well, I'll do some comments, but let me I'll just keep going here. So in performing the study, then it would walk through uh, a process for um, conducting the study and making recommendations back to the legislature. Um, and then in the closing section, it lays out definitions, working definitions for unserved and underserved. And I don't know exactly where it is in law, but council can have probably its point to it. When we did this work on telecom four years ago, we named it a, a planning goal, 100 megabit per second, a symmetrical service, right. up and down. We have seen that. <laughs> yeah. And although uh, it was uh, maybe a stretch goal, we didn't realize how stretchy it was. Um, but I think the one thing I've noted passing was that these rates discussed in here are asymmetrical, and I hope the committee will keep an eye on that question because from my experience, the way we end up, when we develop asymmetrical service, it's more about download speed than up. We're creating a system that's designed to sell you stuff for the most part. It's you can watch movies, you can do whatever, but if you want to create community value, as in um, telemedicine, uh, remote, uh, highly interactive teaching. The best physics professor can teach classes all over the state with a high-speed symmetrical connection, but not with an asymmetrical connection. So I just wanted to flag that as uh, something that you might want to investigate as you w work your way through. Um, we did, Senator McDonald came to GovOps, I think it was two years ago, and we created a legal construct for Communication utilities, and I think EC fibers, maybe the best known one of those. Okay. Um, I don't know if uh, really if it's opening up the opportunity to utilities is a better option for the state than uh, looking for four more virtual maids to operate around the state of Vermont and grow homegrown networks. We figured out it's not just herbs. You've got to have community members with a half million dollars to upfront you. And you've got to have the know-how to put this kind of a deal together. And that's something that every community does not have you know, an abundance of riches down there when he started. Um, the other yes, the challenge the, was the, uh, the likelihood of take-up rates was somewhat right. diminished. In Spend over a month because of the, right. the, the more prevalence of cable companies, right. which might also generate some more resistance. Right. Um, the other thing, you know, in uh, utility law, generally you can't cross subsidize, so old gas and electric companies have to be careful to rate this into their gas service versus their electric company. So if we're now introducing another level of service that a, a utility, a monopoly utility is offering, 
how do we make sure that we're not running a file of cross subsidization? So how do the rate structures get developed? Um, the other thing is there's questions around rate basing. So if a uh, utility makes a capital investment and they can build it into their rate base, they have a guaranteed rate of return, that's a very unlevel yeah. playing field compared to asking some independent or self-funded group to show up and fund their infrastructure investment when they can't rate base. They have to go out, sell it, and make their money in real time. On the service, not uh, on any kind of guaranteed right. rate of return. Um, when the other thing that came up as issues, as all this kind of work has been done without having the utility having an ownership or service role, was the issues around make ready, the making a pole ready to carry um, fiber, even if it's owned by somebody else. Sometimes things have to be moved on poles to make space on the pole for the fiber people run there. Uh, and make ready has been a bit of a bugaboo, so I, I don't know the current status, but it will be something. We, we we're familiar with that issue. Okay. Um, the other thing is, as drafted, it was really responding to um, Christine Alpha's idea that we all heard about this summer right. fall. So, uh, you know. Drafted as electric distribution and transmission. So I, I wonder about when we say transmission, are we uh, also inviting Delta to participate as a pure transmission utility? They have, uh, I think, a large fiber backbone right. that I don't know if they are allowed or do offer any of their capacity and to others. To we're asking them to come in and just talk to us about fiber. Right? So we'll and find out. Even though it's not poles and wires. Um, when I think about something like Vermont Gas. I don't know what kind of communication infrastructure they built out. They say built a this, I don't even know, but I don't know if there's any reason to leave other utilities right. out that might be interested partners. And then last, I was thinking about, we do have folks like, besides EC Fiber, uh, Burlington Telecom is another example of someone deciding that they want to build infrastructure. And it might be worth I don't know enough about Burlington Telecom, but I, the point was to sort of open the discussion to yeah. um, find other partners who might help address this perpetual, underwhelming build-out of infrastructure that, to provide service. And there was an NCSL <coughs> or I saw the internet about other states authorizing, so I asked Maria to see if she could find out about that. Um, if there's broadband strung out there, or wire that's, you know, bands that are available, we should know about it. Right. I know that when I was doing VTA work, there, there were maps at that point, I'm sure there must be still, with all the uh, fiber and all the, including how much dark fiber is in unused fiber. It was just, uh, I think they used to lay 144 fibers at a time in, in a single cable, and then necessarily like them all up. Right. Using a few. So, I don't know how much we're still trying to find out where the fiber is, not about how much of it's used. Okay, Senator Pearson. Uh, this is intriguing to me, and I appreciate you bringing it forward. I, uh, one of the things that I remember from when Christine was in here was this notion that utilities ought to string the fiber but not provide the service. That it all be strictly open access, sort of, yeah. to be leased. I think that had to do with it, that guaranteed return and the. Well, I guess I'm wondering. I don't yeah. see that itemized here. No. Um, do you care? Or do you have an opinion or anything? No, I, I mean I don't know what would make sense as a business model for them if they would actually uh, build and own the infrastructure and just lease capacity on it, or if they might. Uh, build and sell and somehow offer maintenance to somebody else. Because she, she was I, talking about build because they can get better rates of interest and better terms because they have a guaranteed. And they don't have this. this yeah, but I, I think that might cross over into some of the cross subsidiz subsidization yeah. or some of those other issues, but okay. worth looking at. So my, I haven't kept pace with the industry, and I know it changes fast, but I think, as I remember, the sort of a default running 
quote unquote running five without a watt down the poles will involve this bundle of 144 uh, sort of a standard never maybe that's not true anymore but the point was uh, that the utility <coughs> would want to have communication infrastructure for itself would have a vast amount of capacity left to sell or release or whatever it was to somebody else and maybe it's another income stream that helps in some way um, reduce cost of service Was a uh, conversation started. I think that's what we're all looking for. Okay. Maybe it's interest. Well, thank you. Okay. Let's go back to operating the government. For <coughs> something like that. Charter changes. Charter changes. Oh, we have a specialist on that. It's time to year. Rubber, rubber stamp. stamp. Rubber stamp. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Good to see you. Okay, bye. -bye. Thank bye. you. Maria, you want to? I don't know if you've had how much research you've had time to do on this one. This is your bill, Senator. No, the next oh. one is mine. Remember, we had the right. public utility power people in, and they need PUC permission to buy a coil of wire or a new high lift. And that that's the one that's coming is that bill. This is, but I did ask Maria to take a look at just an article that popped up on the NCSL Today website. And it looks like other states who may not have our system uh, are are looking at least at if there's fiber out there, why aren't we using it? The floor is yours. Okay. Maria Royal with Legislative Council. And um, just a couple of things I wanted to mention in terms of the study itself, um, S91. It does contemplate that uh, the co op or the utility, so it could be an investor in utility, might provide the service or might lease capacity. So that is included in the study as an option for consideration. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And then uh, in terms of what's happening in other states, you had referenced a particular bill in Georgia, HB 23, which passed the House February 11th in Georgia, uh, has not been enacted at this point, which allows electric co-ops to offer broadband either directly or indirectly by contracting with an ISP or establishing a broadband affiliate to operate and provide service. Interestingly, um, and I did not know this when I first started to look into the issue, under Vermont law, currently, um, the electric co-ops are allowed to offer broadband um, service. I don't believe they're doing it. And that uh, provision of law was enacted, I believe, in the year 2000. Um, there is a significant uh, prohibition on cross-subsidization, which comes up everywhere, yeah. this issue of uh, the costs of the broadband service not being allocated to the electric rate payers and making sure that the accounts are, are separate. Um, the Georgia bill is very clear about that and has auditing provisions, and there's even a private right of, private right of action for members of the co-op who believe that there has been some cost subsidization. So there are additional protections, should you want to go forward, that you might want to consider adding to the Vermont sure. law. The only other thing that I will mention, because it is significant, there is a lot of federal money available right now for a broadband build-out um, available to the electric co-ops under the Vermont law. However, there is a restriction from the co-ops actually uh, taking money from universal, uh, the rural utility service to finance um, build out. So the you know why? why? I, I'd be speculating. I don't know if it's a, a competition issue of wanting to ensure the providers, broadband providers, there isn't some unfair access to federal money, public dollars that might, I, I honestly okay. don't know but the I answer. I'm speculating, why? but that is something. Well, eight if we did that in 2000, the broadband 
world was very different than it is today. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't think we've got too many nice flat valleys with towns in them that don't have broadband. I think we're looking at where the old co-op electric utilities took, which is the hills and the dales and the places that are harder to get to, and it might. Maybe we'll have Washington County Electric Co-op come in just because they're one of the larger ones, and they are definitely rural. Let's see what they have to say, because they have a customer base who I think would support this. So see if they can tell us why they haven't done it. And I did look just more generally um, at a national level, how many co-ops right now provide broadband or contract or lease yeah. capacity. And the figure that I found, but I haven't been able to confirm it, it's about 100 electric co-ops nationwide are currently. National. Yeah. Nationally. Mm -hmm. So 100, about 100. Not so I'm trying to track down where they are, mm -hmm. and then I can look more specifically yeah. at how those states regulate. Mm -hmm. We would think for us that the similar states will probably be the ones on the East Coast with mountains and West Virginia, um, you know, the, the, the Southern Tennessee, the, those areas. They, I think, have more big open flatland than we do because they, they run east to west and we run north to south right down the middle of the mountains. So um, West Virginia is probably the one closest to us. Um, but how do we, how do we, yeah, how, see if anybody can help us figure I'll this out. I'll see what I can find yeah. out. What, uh, the only other thing I was going to say is this, this study was modeled after a Virginia study that was enacted last year. Um, that study was to be done by the distribution of utilities themselves, not the regulators. Electric. The utilities themselves did the this study. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, and so several of those reports have been filed and to the extent you want to see what some of the responses were from those utilities in Virginia. Is, is there any uh, enduring themes like it costs too much or why bother or, I mean, is, is, is anything kind of coming out as a common thread through those? Uh, I've uh, only looked at a couple. two of them. Okay. And um, that's not enough. I don't know how many issue. were submitted. Um, I think the big is issue is cross subsidization, and then just what are the economics actually work? Okay. And then uh, making sure the laws are amended to allow for the that there are no regulatory impediments. But okay. Yes. Is I think you were saying and I could be wrong that like that Thompson Telephone and Fairpoint is telephone and Waitsfield is telephone companies. And when you try and go up on those poles, it's the telephone companies that own the poles, is that correct? As opposed to other towns that the poles might be owned by like Green Mountain Power or Washington Electric Co op. Is that the, those the two? Uh, yes. Did I, I'm not sure what, what was the question. What, where is the wire? Where are the well, wires being strung now with utilities? If you, a utility wants to do it to be, to be in the business, yeah. um, they have an advantage if they own the poles, whereas yes. Washington mm -hmm. Electric would yeah. would have a different reason for doing it because it's a co-op and Green yeah. Mountain Power. Yeah. But if you were trying to, like EC Fiber that went into an area that didn't have a lot of broadband, which was an advantage, they had to make deals with the local telephone companies, yes. right. not electric company. Yes, and I think that's I think that is happening. There are some and there's some joint ownership of poles with between electric and telephone companies. So yeah. Both in the central Vermont area that's trying to jump start or get started. They pretty much Washington Electric poles uh, or Green Mountain Power on the main Green roads. Mountain Power is Montpelier Barry, but you get up into the hills and out up that road that turns into Washington Electric Co-op. You kind of go north and west. And the different ownerships would have different interests. Yes. 
I think this is looking at municipals and at the fact that since the advent of smart meters, municipalities have been putting up fiber. And if they've got fiber and they're only using a couple channels, perhaps they could rent out a few. I think it's looking at what's there already as part of the concept. And I think you reminded me of uh, something that I do now recall from reading some of those reports. I think in Virginia, uh, what was not obvious necessarily <coughs> when I looked at the study, but what became obvious when I looked at the reports, what most utilities were contemplating is uh, this access to middle mile fiber. Yeah. Um, and you're right, a lot of electric utilities in modernizing their grids um, and allowing for smart meters and uh, installing fiber between all their substations, this is, the availability is increasing and it's taking advantage of perhaps the opportunity of not only modernizing the grid system, but also opening up access to broadband for customers in rural areas. Okay. So this bill asks, uh, Michael. So you said something about there being a lot of federal money available that the co-ops can access it. So who can access it? Well, the co-ops in Vermont. There's a Vermont law that specifically says, let's, let's see if I actually have the language. It's a Vermont law. It's a Vermont law. So it says non-electric activities shall not be financed by loans or grants from the RUS any successor federal agency. RUS. And there's about $600 million of Why? RUS money. Why, Why wouldn't those rural co-ops well, we, we will, Yeah, we will, we will figure that out. Maybe the Public Utility Commission could see if they could figure out why we did that. I did get, I have a, the bill file from the Okay, okay. And that will be good. Is that big? All right. Uh, so I can learn more from that. Process. Okay. A prohibition on municipalities funding stuff that was passed shortly after Burlington ran into its financial oh. difficulties. And is that? That may be it. I think this may be predates. Okay. It's just 2000. It did Okay. We will, we will figure that out. I want to, I'm watching the clock and we still okay. have the. Uh, captive insurance bill. So we got one more of these. Okay. Can yes. I ask one quick question? Yeah. Yeah. So how much would a study like this cost and how would it be paid for? Okay. So there is no, I, I know that's a great question for the department. I don't know how much it will cost. And there's no appropriation attached to this. It, it will go to the wall next door unless we do something else with it. Okay, next one. Municipal utility capital investment. We had these folks in earlier. Um, my understanding is that the Public Utility Commission came back with some moderations other than just saying uh, that the original bill I had drafted. So I asked to have that change to reflect the request from the commission and bring it to so at this point, yes, um, I think we're So what the draft that you should have in front of you or in your file looks like this. It's actually a proposed committee strike all amendments. They have both. They have the, oh, as okay. introduced them. They have so this is basically the bill as introduced and yeah. the language that's and then new this is, the, that has been proposed by the Public Utility Commission is bolded. It's bolded. That's, so can, that's on the top. Yep. Yep. So um, just as a reminder, this bill concerns uh, municipal electric companies and the Vermont Public Power Supply Authority, which represents at least 12 of the municipal electric companies. Um, it concerns bonding capacity at the municipal level and also through Vermont Public Power Supply Authority. So, and I know you've, you've heard about this already, so um, I don't want to repeat everything you've heard, but just briefly, so section one um, concerns the municipal indebtedness generally, and then the proposal 
is on page three of the bill, and it's specific, again, to municipal electric companies. And this has to do um, with whether or not they need voter approval, because in general, when a municipality issues debt, it needs to get uh, voter approval at an, an annual or special meeting for that purpose. At least over a certain amount. Well, the proposal here is to have a threshold below which you would not be required to get voter approval, that the legislative body of the municipality can make the decision. And the proposal is, on, you can see on the bottom of page three, so notwithstanding the provisions of subsection B, which requires voter approval, a legislative branch of a municipal corporation, as defined, this is the municipal electric companies, may authorize by, by resolution the issuance of bonds in an amount not to exceed 50% of the total assets of the municipal plant without the need for voter approval. Uh, it then goes on, and this is a, a proposed amendment by the PUC to specify that nothing in this subsection shall be interpreted as eliminating the requirement for approval from the PUC. So this is okay. voter approval at the municipal level. There's another statute that deals with when the PUC. And I think we heard that if the PUC doesn't take you up until June, then you have to wait until next March or hold a special meeting right. to which generally no one shows up. Um, and so this would eliminate if the PUC gives you permission up to this 50% threshold. Well, yep. You won't sure. have to get the second vote. Right, two issues, a timing issue. Right. Um, so actually we can look at it, maybe it might be helpful uh, just to jump ahead a little bit. Um, so if you look on page five, so this is now in a section of law that concerns the issuance of bonds by all regulated utilities or all um, companies subject to the jurisdiction of the PUC. And if you look on in subdivision C3, uh, this is the, what was a bit um, perceived to be problematic. Um, if the PUC issues a ruling in accordance with subdivision one, so if it gives consent to the bond issuance or doesn't rule within a specified period of time, the municipality must, and the existing law is subsequently obtain voter approval. So the problem that was raised was that having to do it that way as opposed to getting voter approval and then, oh, and then be able go. to issue bonds okay. as soon as you get, that it, it would help to enable the municipalities to take their vote at the annual meeting rather than holding a special meeting if the timing doesn't work out. Right. So that's, okay. there's a timing issue there. So this just lets it be either side of the... Correct. Okay. Yes. So if it's required, if you need voter approval, because now you don't always need voter approval if you are below the threshold, um, that can happen at any time. So, so in this, in the examples that you're discussing, it says a municipal corporation, that means a township or a, or a water district or, or a, a a town that had its um, had a municipal electric grid. Is that what we're talking about? Yep. So it's defined. Um, the actual reference is to a municipal plant as defined in Title 30, Section 2901. Those are electric companies, municipal electric companies. So they're the entities that are being released. Might be of. located within a discrete. Yep. Not part of a larger. Correct. They're service territory. Yeah. Or even part of a municipality within a within a greater town. Is that what it defines? I don't know where the I don't know all the service territories of the current <coughs> electric, electric utilities. I think we've got a, a list. There's Do you represent uh, those things? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, Melissa Bailey okay. for my public power supply authority. So we have 12 municipal members. Do you want me to just describe who they are quickly? Well, I, I'm not sure what question is being asked. Is this asked. what we're discussing? Or yes. We're discussing something else. Yes, no. the, okay. the electric, the 12, 12 Northfield, 14 municipal yeah. electric utilities. 
Yeah. Yeah. And then Thank you. Yes, this is not, not to be Green Mountain Power. This not is to be not confused with a, a central. Central, yeah, yeah. No, this right. is the small municipal, municipally <coughs> owned. But they are generally, they are separate. They have a separate board of directors and yep. they are revenue based. I believe any bonding they do, they're an nice. enterprise fund, if I remember it correctly. So um, then, so we just talked about the, the timing issue of voter approval that's required. So now on page six, in terms of when you need the PUC's authority or consent, yeah. um, if you look on page six, beginning on line seven, uh, this is a proposal <coughs> from the PUC. Um, you, you don't need consent. If um, you issue if the issue of bonds or notes without the consent, provided the amount of the issuance plus the amount of any bond or note issuances during the previous 12 calendar months does not exceed 20% of the municipality's total assets. So you're looking back to see how much total debt the municipality might incur. Um, it can't be 20% of the municipality's total assets. And then also, after the proposed issuance, the total amount of the municipality's outstanding bonds, notes, or evidences of indebtedness would not exceed 50% of the total assets. Okay, so this says that if you want to, you need to go buy a new pickup truck be your municipal utility. And you can do that without a vote or without PUC commit permission, provided that in the previous 12 months you have not bonded or borrowed for 20% or more of your assets, or that your total indebtedness does not exceed 50%. At the 50%, then you fall back to PUC and voter PUC. approval. Not voter approval. Oh, well, yeah. this second condition is just for the PUC. Just for the PUC, okay. There, uh, in this provision here, page six, it seems to switch to the municipality's assets. Is, is that intentional that we're not talking about the utility anymore that is owned by the municipality but their entire asset? I believe that's correct. And, and uh, what the, the bifurcation in B we're saying you, you can't have a total debt load of more than 50% total assets. And a, we're saying 20% in the last 12 months. In the past year. Is the valid process by the PUC? Yes. Okay. okay. And then the other thing I just didn't mention, because we kind of skipped over it, but back on page four in section two, this just exempts the Vermont Public Power Supply Authority um, altogether from having to get PUC approval. For their bond issuances. Oh, and they are the association. They are the association. Okay. Functions and that's similar to a bond bank. And they issue their own bonds. All right. Okay. We will have um, the representatives and maybe the utility, the PUC. Um, we'll have you in next week and you can tell us yes, no, or maybe on this stuff. Can I just ask a quick clarifying yep. question for you? On the bottom of page three where it talks about the issuance cost shall not, in an amount not to exceed 50% of total assets, um, that's where we avoid the public vote in this draft, right? The very last line there, 21, not to exceed 50% of the total assets of said municipal plan. So that's the utility. That's, yep, that's what the, we When we say total assets, does that measure their debt as well? Like, did debt come off? 
you know, if they have assets of 100 million and debts of 20 million, do we consider their total assets to be 80 million? Or, or see what I'm saying? Are you, are you now talking about the, the later? No, nope, I'm talking about the trigger for the immunities. For not, for no voter approval. Right, is, is that they're not trying to borrow more than 50% of their total assets. Of the municipal plant. Right. So the utility, so, so the, that means, I'm assuming, plant yep. is BED. Yep. yep. Um, my question is, if BED is carrying a lot of debt, does that get reflected in the term total assets? Okay. I would have to confirm that. Okay. I think so, but maybe I'm missing something. That's a good question. It might make things do. Do any of the interested parties want to testify on this? Or I know there's been a lot of give and take. If, if are you? Yeah, we can. We're happy if you want to take two minutes. We're happy to do that. And Melissa can do that. I mean, it, we're talking about just the municipality, so not the overall municipal debt. So we're talking about municipality here. That's a okay, Jamie, why don't you come up? Okay. Just tell us in the room. I know. Davis. Right. Jamie Fee on behalf of the Vermont Public Power Supply Authority. Um, and thank you for the time. Yes, since the bill was drafted at the time, if you recall, when we had some representatives from Swan in here and, and Melissa Bill. Remember from the so, waterfall? Exactly. And the, the line truck. The and, thing, and, and yeah. All of that. And we, at the time, we're talking with the Public Utility Commission. And so this draft here is sort of a consensus product that we're bringing to you uh, for your consideration. Um, and in essence, the, the, the two-step uh, sort of provision is, is really a short-term and long-term sort of limitation on uh, the borrowing. If you recall, I think Senators Brock and Sarak and you sort of said, well, if this utility has no outstanding debt, they could bond for a pretty big amount, correct? And the PUC had the same sort of concern. So that's why you have this 20% initial cap looking back 12 months. So you're always going to have that first 20% limitation. So if the utility wants to then go ahead and bond again, maybe two years down the road, um, they'll look to see what's outstanding. They'll have the 20% immediate cap, but their overall cap could not exceed 50% of their total debt. And when they hit 50%, then they have to go to the, the public vote rules. and to the PUC. The normal rules will apply. The normal rules Section that are there now. The only they can move that vote around so they can do the, the vote before they, depending on the time of year and what they're doing, they can Correct. move the vote to a more convenient time. And from my understanding, I can look to phone a friend over there. When counting the total debt the, uh, or the total assets, Current liabilities, including bonds, are not counted on against that? Yeah, I think we can respond to that hopefully clearly. Most be able to that. Um, so what we're looking at is the total assets that the electric utility owns. And for instance, 10 million would be like the midpoint of our 12 members. So if you own 10, if you own 10 million in assets, you could borrow up to 5 million. So to Senator Pearson's question, um, the assets don't directly take into account the debt, it's it's a comparison between debt to overall assets. You it's total debt to total assets. Total assets. So in a year you can borrow up to twenty percent of your total assets and in and overall you can borrow up to fifty percent without needing to use the approval of voter approval. Um, and just to respond to the one other question that was raised, I do not think that there was supposed to be a distinction between municipal plant, which is defined as the electric company, and overall municipality, um, which is which came up in the amendment that the PUC offered. But I believe those are supposed to be consistent. You're always looking at the electric utilities assets, not mm -hmm. the overall municipalities assets. Right. They're so separate. You know, it's just what the electric company is on. Yeah. It's like water districts within the town. It's their municipalities actually unto themselves, I think, in I, 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 I could be, it could be just a difference in the terms that you used in Title 24 versus Title 30. Right. If the committee was clarified, we could certainly do that. Okay. And you can assume the commission is okay with this since we yeah. took your ass, we yeah. took your amendments, okay. Yeah. All right. Where did the 50% figure come from? That's a pretty big jump from, I got a 
ask voters for 10 grand to 50 percent of that average. So that's a five million dollar, right? That strikes me as a pretty big leap. I'm curious. Um, sure, we did do some research nationally around what kind of debt um, public utilities typically carry. Um, I do have our ranges, our utilities carry anywhere from 5% to 65% of indebtedness currently. So once they're above 50, we have to go for approval. At any time, they wanted to borrow additional we thought that was appropriate. Um, but again, just acknowledging that some of the utilities have about a million dollars in assets, our smaller ones. And so we wanted that um, the discretion so that they could still borrow for equipment like a line of that would be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's striking the balance um, between giving them some latitude to conduct routine utility business, make purchases that are routine um, without having overly burdened with that. 